Hello, everyone. My name is Ruthie Talani, and I'm the chair of the IGCF Education Committee. I'd like to welcome you to the first IGCF COVID-19 Project ECHO. Before we get started, I'd like to thank a minute, take a minute to thank you all for being here. During such an unprecedented time, we know there are many demands for your time, and we trust you will find tremendous value in today's session. As information regarding the pandemic is continually evolving, and the care of our patients is rapidly changing, our goal is to bring together the global community where we can discuss gynecologic oncology cases with special consideration to COVID-19. I'm having a quick advance the next slide. A few housekeeping notes on echo format and etiquette. We will have a case presentation followed by a didactic and close with a 20-minute Q&A segment. Panelists will be the only ones able to speak during the presentation, and attending microphones will be muted. We have collected questions through the registration process, and additional questions may be submitted today during today's presentation through the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. We will do our best to address as many questions as possible. If you encounter any technical issues, you can connect with the IGCS staff via the chat feature. Today's session will be recorded and shared on the IGCS website within 48 hours. I'd like to start with a brief overview of the COVID-19 situation. As mentioned today, this is a session outline, and the recording will be up on the website. As you all know, the coronavirus, or SARS-CoV-2 2019, is a single strain of RNA virus. It predominantly uh, affects the lungs, the upper and lower respiratory tra tracts, by binding to the angiotensin-converting enzyme site in the epithelium. Common symptoms include fever, cough, shortness of breath, myalgia, but there are also GI symptoms, such as diarrhea and nausea and vomiting. I can have the next slide. We know that transmission is predominantly due to respiratory droplets and close personal contact. However, we have to be aware that touching the surface and then contact with our oral mucosal surfaces can also transmit the virus. And this is important, particularly when considering surgery in patients who are COVID-19 positive. Bodily fluid has also demonstrated the detection of the COVID-19 virus. However, the transmission is not clear. It has been detected in respiratory tract specimens as well as blood and stool specimens. Of note, in pregnant patients who are COVID-19 positive, it has not been detected in breast milk and or amniotic fluid, but the transmission risk is still unknown. Viral shedding is highest earlier in the course and can occur in um, patients 24 to 48 hours prior to symptoms. It continues for up to two weeks, or excuse me, for seven to 12 days in mild and moderate cases and greater than two weeks in severe cases. Even after recovery, TCR positive uh, test tag can result up to four weeks later, but it's unknown if this is related to an infectious uh, condition. Just a review of the timeline, the first case was identified in December 8th in Wuhan, China, and as you can see from this timeline, it rapidly escalated. In March, on March 11th, the pandemic was declared by the WHO, and on April 2nd, over 1 million cases were um, confirmed. This number is continuing to escalate at a very rapid rate. This is just a general geographic distribution, and as you can see, this affects everyone worldwide, and we are excited to have many members from across the world here today, and we hope that your um, interactions help enhance the content of today's program. Just to, before we get started with the case, I just want to review some associated factors in mortality because this really impacts our gynecologic cancer patients. We know that the older patients are at higher risk for um, a, a severe cases of COVID-19. And if we can advance the slide, we also know that comorbidities, particularly cancer, um, it has a higher rate of severe cases or even deaths from this condition. And if we can advance the slide again and again. The impact on cancer patients has also been evaluated, although this data is still emerging. We know that patients who are either cancer survivors or active patients with cancer, that they have a higher rate of need for invasive ventilation, ICU admission, or death. And you can see from the survival curve here that patients without cancer have much improved recovery than patients with cancer. Next slide. I have the pleasure of introducing our esteemed panelists, Jihan Lu from a professor and director in the Department of Gynecologic Oncology at Sun Yan Set University in Guangzhou, uh, China, is joining us. We also have um, 
uh, sorry, we also have uh, Dr. Daniela Rivero, OBGYN consultant from Campus Biomedica uh, Hospital in Rome, Italy, and Renee Perheja, uh, Professor of Gynecological Oncology from Instituto Nacional de Cancerologia and Clinica de Oncologia Estorga in Colombia. I also have the pleasure of introducing our case presenter, Dr. Wendell Nauman, Professor and Director of Research and Guidance Biologic Oncology and Associate Medical Director of Clinical Trials at the Levine Cancer Institute in um, Charlotte, North Carolina. And our didactic lecture will be presented by Emma Rossi, Assistant Professor of OBGYN at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill in the United States. And we'll be speaking on our March 24th publication, How Long Is It to Sa Safely Delay Gynecologic Cancer Surgery? Without further delay, I will turn it over to Dr. Nauman for case presentation. Thanks, Ruthie. So please note that this case consultations uh, do not create uh, or otherwise establish a, a provider-patient relationship between any IGCS volunteer clinician and any patient whose case is being presented. Responsibility for the patient remains with the medical team who cares for the patient at the uh, presenting institution. So we have uh, for our case presentation, a 71 year old woman who is postmenopausal and has had about one month of pelvic pain. Her past medical history includes type two diabetes, chronic hypertension, hyperlipidemia, and hypothyroidism. Her family history is relatively unremarkable. The CT scan shows a complex nine centimeter right adnexal mass with omental nodularity and small volume ascites, which is not amenable to ultrasound drainage. Abnormal labs include an elevated CA125 at 579 and a slightly elevated CEA at eight. Physical exam, patient is obese with a BMI of 42. She is somewhat limited in her mobility with an ECOG score of two. And on physical exam, the only finding is a nine centimeter slightly tender right adnexal mass. The CT scan is shown, the mass looks highly suspicious for malignancy. So the plan of treatment was because the patient was somewhat frail and um, uh, we were a little bit worried about the ability for her to tolerate surgery, we were gonna get a biopsy of the omentum to confirm the diagnosis and we had planned to treat her with three cycles of neoadjuvant chemotherapy, followed by surgery, possibly minimally invasive, after three cycles. This was scheduled, but CT scan called and informed us that we could not do a biopsy as the case was considered non-essential due to the COVID-19 epidemic. I called the radiology department and they still refused to do the biopsy because they were so busy. We were informed that all surgeries that are not immediately life-threatening are on hold due to increased surge in our hospital. And I could not get a uh, endoscopy scheduled for the same reason to evaluate her elevated CEA. So our options at this point were to give chemotherapy without pathologic confirmation or to wait until she was symptomatic. So over the next two weeks, the symptoms got worse with increasing abdominal pain. Her CA125 increased to 1,253. After discussion, the patient opted for chemotherapy without a biopsy, but now the infusion unit is closed due to the need for additional hospital bed space. So I think this highlights the rapidly changing situation that we have in uh, many places. I think the um, situation is different for everybody, but we have to remember that this doubles every three to five days, depending on where you are. And so short-term plans will change rapidly. And I just wanted to discuss this in terms of deviations from standard of care and see what our panelists had to say about this.
So we can open it up to the panel to make a couple of comments on if situations that they've experienced regarding um, delay of care, particularly diagnostics. Daniela, being in Italy, I'd like to start with you. Yes, and it's a very interesting case that could occur in each of our hospitals. So I agree with the choice to postpone the big surgery in this moment in patients with ovarian cancer in advanced stage, like this case with a mental involvement with peritoneal carcinomatosis in favor of neoadjuvant chemotherapy and later surgery. In fact, in this particular moment, when we're planning a treatment for our patients, it's mandatory to consider multiple factors, such as comorbidities, age, immunostatus, because first of all, we should to prevent that patients becoming infected, but also we should preserve the hospital resources uh, for COVID-19 patients. For example, the intensive, intensive care unit beds or ventilators or blood products. So the risk uh, to start uh, a treatment without a specific diagnosis could lead to an incorrect diagnosis. Thinking about, for example, a Krugenberg tumor or breast metastasis or specific histotype like the low grade that, as we know, the low grade can respond very well to the chemotherapy. So in Italy, for example, we try to centralize oncological patients to the refer center. So it's very difficult that a patient can be have a surgical biopsy by laparoscopy or by CT scan. But I have a question for Wendell, is possible. And do you think that a possibility, Wendell, it could be have a cytology, for example, from axitis by ultrasound to have more information. Yeah, certainly uh, that would be my choice if she had uh, fluid that was amenable to uh, biopsy. But yeah. I do, um, and I have been fooled before in this situation by cytology where the, uh, as you pointed out, the cancer might be a low grade, and that's difficult to call on the cytology diagnosis. Yeah. Okay. And I know you experienced this in, in Italy in terms of just closing down all care. Is this, is this a situation that you run into? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yes, it's the same. And June, from China, you probably have experience also. Um, do you have any comments? Yeah, I I just uh, do agree to, uh, to give this uh, patient uh, maybe the new agent chemotherapy first, but uh, uh, it's hard to get the biopsy, uh, get the uh, pathology results. This is uh, a big question. So I agree with uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Rob Rowe's uh, uh, comments. And we need some uh, identification of diagnosis. So uh, at this time, maybe we can more often to use some non-invasive methods to make a more clear uh, diagnosis. Uh, sometimes, uh, such as for this lady, maybe <clears throat> we can test uh, HE4, uh, another uh, tumor mark. If HE4 increased, um, obviously, maybe just uh, indicate uh, there's a malignancy and also high grade uh, malignancies. Uh, uh, I think uh, this is uh, another way. Uh, also, I think uh, uh, could, uh, could we just uh, give the patient new adjuvant chemotherapy for cycle if uh, she is uh, uh, had a good response to the chemo? maybe uh, to help us to make the right diagnosis. Thank you. So what we're going to do next is a couple of poll questions. If we can move to the next slide. So we, are, we clearly know that there's lots of delays, and we just want to see how it's affecting you. So the first question is, are you anticipating significant delays in surgery, radiation, imaging, or chemotherapy as a result of the pandemic compared to your normal schedule? And you can just click on whichever um, time frame you're experiencing.
And then the second question, which we need to scroll down for, um, how have these changes impacted cancer care? And it essentially ranges from no changes to care to currently cannot deliver cancer care, as you heard in this case. And while you're voting, I'd like to ask Dr. Pareja if he has any comments on, on these questions that we just posed to the group before we get to the didactic. Renee, any comments? Um, according to the presented case, the only option now for this lady is surgery. And even during COVID-19 pandemic, you will have to perform some, some surgeries. So you need to be assured that this patient is not a COVID patient right now by asking for a rapid test, CAT scan, and then take her to the OR, um, taking all the preventive measures, PPE for all the, for all the equipment, because we will have to operate some patients and this patient is getting worse. She is right now in pain. So you need to operate some patients under special circumstances. Thank you. And I'd like now like to introduce Dr. Emma Rossi, um, who's gonna present delays in gynecologic cancer surgery. Thank you very much, Ritu. Um, in advance, I have no conflicts of interest to declare. So why are we talking about delays in surgery in this era? Um, well, obviously, we want to preserve personal protective equipment. We want to keep our patients out of the hospital and ideally as many staff as possible out of the hospital or alternatively resourced elsewhere during this pandemic. And we want to preserve other resources like inpatient beds, ICU beds, and ventilators, keep our patients out of the emergency room from a post-operative complication readmission, for example. And in order to facilitate this, most healthcare systems are implementing some kind of restrictions on elective surgeries. And, and, and elective is deemed as no harm will occur if the surgery is not performed. But then there are clearly surgeries where harm will be incurred if it's not performed, but there's, some, there's a time window in which it's safe. And we often, healthcare systems will refer to these as um, priority type cases. And cancer cases are often included in that. And so depending upon where your health system is in relation to this anticipated or experienced surge in COVID patients, there may be anywhere from a restriction to, on all surgeries, as we heard in the case presented, to sort of a gray zone where priority type cases are allowed. And how they define that is if, once again, if harm will occur if the surgery is not performed within a certain time period. But the decision making about whether that harm will occur is left up to us, the surgeons, to determine. Um, so what are some of the harms that potentially could occur? We'll advance the slide, there we go. So for, from the patient perspective, there's certainly some concern, uh, some fear and anxiety regarding will the cancer spread, will it progress, will it become worse, will I, something that might have been curable now will be incurable. And many of our patients don't know their diagnosis before surgery, um, or certainly they may not know their stage and therefore prognosis and future therapies. And us as surgeons are also concerned that potentially something that right now is operable might become inoperable if we wait. We're worried about not advocating for our patients and their needs, which may be different from other patients. Um, and we're, there's some personal concerns regarding medical legal issues, some concerns regarding um, um, uh, our livelihoods being put on hold. And then uh, something that's a little, uh, that's something that I could say I'm experiencing, which is somewhat of a feeling of impotency. When you're canceling cases and stopping doing work during a time when our colleagues are actually ramping up what they're doing. So these are perceptions of, um, of potential harms. But what's the reality? Well, there is a little bit of data to look at this. Um, in endometrial cancer is a really nice paper that was published a few years ago by Dr. Shalowitz. This is an American study, so looking at a US population where delays in surgery are usually driven by uh, a confounding variable such as patient comorbidities or some other systematic issue which is likely to confound and portend a worse prognosis from cancer. Um, 
What Dr. Shalowitz's group did is they separated out endometrial cancer cases in the National Cancer Database, which is a large nationwide database capturing about 70% of cancer surgeries. And they separated out low risk cancers, so grade one and grade two cancers from high risk cancers, grade three and non endometrioid cell type. And that's relevant because that's kind of how we think about these cancers when we're determining priority. Um, what they looked at was the survival um, for every week of delay from the time of diagnosis. And what they determined was that, first of all, there was not upstaging of cancer. So cancers for whom there was a delay in surgery were not more likely to be advanced cancers than cancers who had their surgery performed earlier. And for the low-grade cancers, they, saw, they observed a safe period of waiting of about eight weeks. Um, and if you look on the slide, you'll see the bottom two uh, figures, the bottom two graphs are the adjusted um, measures and adjusted for various confounders that might portend a worse prognosis like stage, um, race and ethnicity, insurance status, comorbidities, etc. Um, and so on the figure on the bottom left is the low risk cancers. And for about eight weeks, there's a period, it appears a period of safe waiting before uh, mortality goes up with waiting. Interestingly, for the high risk cancers, that period, safe period of waiting appears much longer, meaning that delays in surgery do not appear to impact survival um, for, for several months, actually for, uh, more than four months, 18 weeks before they saw that mortality was, it was higher. Um, why might this be the case? Well, when we think about low risk and low grade cancer, Cancers, these are cancers that are commonly able to be cured by surgery. Um, and so anything that's going to delay that potential curative therapy or impact that curative therapy being delivered is probably going to have a greater relative impact on those patients' outcomes compared to a high-risk cancer where there's multiple other non-surgical factors that are impacting the, how they will or will not survive their cancer. And so while this may be a little counterintuitive, what I learned from this data is that when we're triaging our, our cancer cases either in the out in the outset or in the aftermath of this uh, pandemic we I, we probably shouldn't prioritize high risk endometrial cancers in the timing ahead of low low risk cancers uh, this data was also supported by a systematic review in endometrial cancer um, uh, cases that was published earlier this year. So this, in this systematic review, they looked at multiple studies evaluating outcomes with delay in endometrial cancer surgery, predominantly U.S. centers, but also a couple of Canadian center trials. And what they found, they concluded, was this eight-week period seemed to be a safe period for waiting, after which they did notice some worse outcomes. What about with ovarian cancer? This is more relevant to our case. Well, is it safe to wait? Well, with ovarian cancer, we clearly have a medical alternative to surgery, and that's neoadjuvant chemotherapy. But in normal times, there's a nuanced decision-making regarding when we implement neoadjuvant chemotherapy versus primary cytoreductive surgery. Um, uh, these are not normal times though, and so we're having to call, we're having to change our, our thought processes a little bit about who we do and don't think are candidates for one or the other. For some, it's an algorithmic approach. So if, you're, if your health system is allowing you to do some surgeries other than emergent surgeries, then some, some clinicians are looking for factors that portend a longer hospital stay or maybe a, an admission to a nursing home, which is a very high risk um, activity right now, or an excessive likelihood of admission to ICU. And if a patient has factors that, that would predict that that might be their outcome, then, they, then there's a much more liberal application of neoadjuvant chemotherapy. And then the other alternative option is neoadjuvant chemotherapy for all uh, apparent advanced ovarian fallopian tube primary peritoneal cancer. Well, is that safe? Is it safe to give, that, to give medical therapy or start with medical therapy for all advanced ovarian cancers. Well, there's now three randomized control trials that have uh, have measured the outcomes of, um, of uh, neoadjuvant chemotherapy versus primary cytoreductive surgery in advanced uh, ovarian cancer. I've, I've listed the data here from the Lancet Oncology publication, which pulled the results of two of those large trials. And what the conclusion of these three trials is that neoadjuvant chemotherapy is non-inferior with respect to overall survival and progression-free survival for these advanced diseases. Now, clearly, the 
some small small uh, font there in the publications. And there's some subgroups who do better with one treatment modality versus the other. Um, and so in, once again, in normal times, we typically have rather than an all or none approach, a more nuanced approach to selecting cases. But what this data tells us in these abnormal times, it is probably perfectly safe to offer our patients with apparent advanced ovarian cancer primary neoadjuvant chemotherapy. What about early stage disease? This is a little trickier. So the patient who has an, a complex appearing, worrisome appearing at nexal mass on imaging and elevated tumor markers, is it safe to delay her surgery? Well, in the UK CTOCS trial, which, which was a trial evaluating uh, whether there was benefit to ovarian cancer screening, in the multimodal screening group who underwent ultrasounds and CA125 assessments, those who screened positive with ab abnormalities in those tests did not go straight to surgery. In in fact, there was a mandated six to 12 week wait period before repeat imaging and labs. And then only then if the abnormality still persisted did they go to surgery. And yet in that trial, there was still a significant downshift in stage, meaning in the, in the screened population, there were more stage one and stage two cancers uh, observed. And so the, the, the interpretation of this data, um, the extrapolation of this, is that it appears that this that six to twelve week wait period after identification of an abnormal mass or tumor market elevations does not appear um, to or does appear to be safe um, in still being able to capture early stage cancers. For cervical cancer, we have some built-in um, observations of when we have to delay surgery. We sometimes observe cervical cancer diagnosed in pregnancy, and when that's the case, it's frequently accompanied by uh, a delay in definitive therapy, including radical hysterectomy. And so how do those patients do? Well, fairly consistently in all the observed series, and clearly they're all retrospective series, but a fairly consistent finding is that the survival from their cancer is the same um, when pregnancy, when cervical cancer is identified in pregnancy compared to match controls uh, who have their cancer identified outside of pregnancy. And even when the delays can be as long as on average in this data that's, that you can see on the slide is average is 20 week average delay from time of diagnosis before definitive therapy. And so I think extrapolating from the cervical cancer literature in pregnancy literature, we could, we could feel somewhat reassured with delaying radical hysterectomy for the four to six to eight week period that we may be faced with during the COVID crisis. Similarly, for patients who have had a prior excisional procedure, LEAP or CONE, we know that there's data that supports the safety in waiting for six weeks or so to allow for decreased morbidity at the time of radical hysterectomy. And that's also additional data that for, for small microinvasive lesions, it's probably safe to wait that short period of time. Uh, in this paper, that, which was looking at a Canadian series, uh, lower genital tract cancers, including cervical and vulva cancer, what they observed was that among patients who waited more than 28 days for their surgery, there was no significant progression in disease observed compared to those who had their surgery less than 28 days from time of diagnosis. Now, they did observe some patients who progressed between diagnosis and surgery, and they were all in the group who waited more than 28 days, but the mean length of delay for those patients was actually 75 days, so substantially longer than what's likely the time frame of waiting that we'll be facing during this time. So the summary of all of these, um, all of this data for me speaks to, to the conclusion that it's likely safe to delay surgery for most of our gynecologic cancers for up to six weeks and potentially longer. Uh, obviously this does not apply to emergent conditions, hemorrhage, obstruction, um, and some cases for molar pregnancy or GTN where surgery is indicated that might also fit into an emergent indication. Um, what, another important thing to consider is when are the delays going to start? And so there's certainly usually a, a, about a four week period through which most health systems will experience a severe surge. And during that time, there may be a moratorium on all surgery, on all surgeries other than emergent. And so therefore, if you're, there's some allowance for you to do cancer surgeries before that moratorium on, on all but emergent surgeries, you might want to factor that into your calculations of wait time. You know, there's going to be an, an enforced wait time of probably at least four weeks. And so for, for many of us, we're continuing to perform cancer surgeries um, on a case-by-case -case basis leading up to that so that we don't have, um, we don't exceed our wait time beyond that six to eight week period. Thanks for your attention. Thank you, Emma. And I'd like to um, open it up for questions and answers to the panelists. I'd like to thank the attendees for submitting questions. 
And we also have some pre-registration questions that I think are interesting and um, overlap with some of the questions that were submitted during this session. So I'd like to just start by asking the panelists if they have any comments. There were some um, questions that came in or comments that came in. Um, to, oh, I'm sorry, let me actually go back to the poll. So uh, the poll that we asked earlier, these are the results that we see here where you can see that uh, it looks like most people are having to wait about two to four weeks um, or having a delay of two to four weeks prior to um, being able to uh, do diagnostic or therapeutic intervention. Um, and some people aren't affected yet, which is actually incredible. And then how has this impacted um, care? It looks like there's been a significant impact to care for, for a majority of people um, in how they treated patients. And I think that's what most of us are experiencing. That's almost 50% of the attendees. So thank you for submitting your, your um, responses to that. Um, but one of the comments that's been kind of a theme throughout the questions coming today is, is it truly ethical to delay this care? A patient may be deemed early and then they end up with a, you know, advanced stage at final pathology. You know, how do we rectify this? How do we, how do we um, discuss this issue with our patients? So I'd like to open this up to the entire panel. I'll start with Dr. Nauman. Well, I mean, we're going to do the best we can for as long as we can. I mean, this is this is uh, almost a wartime triage in many areas of the world um, that that we may not have the luxury of providing standard of care to patients, and that was really the the point. I mean, I, I, I we're going to have to be nimble. And some of the questions have come in about you know what do you do? What do you do if if you don't have surgery? What do you do if you don't have diagnostic procedures? Um, I, I I just heard from there's one question about prioritizing chemotherapy in terms of who gets chemo and you're going to have to decide who is the most important patient to operate on so for me um as was brought up by one of the uh, uh attendees was you know I, I we prioritize our high grade endometrials more than anything because there's no other effective treatment we can't give them neoadjuvant chemotherapy we don't have um radiation is probably not the best option for them so i you know, how, how do you do that? And, and who do you prioritize chemotherapy for? I mean, if you have very limited resources, you're going to give it to the patients, curative first, and, and then down the road. Yeah, uh, Daniela, do you have any comments? Oh, uh, yes. Um, I think it is feasible. I think the best choice is the surgery for that patient in which surgery is, is, uh, can, could be uh, led up a benefit. So I think it's, uh, um, it's not possible worldwide for the COVID-19 pandemic. So in that patient with advanced stage and in that patient we know um, the patient is not sadoreductive, it's important to, do, to perform the kidney adjuvant chemotherapy and later the surgery. So for example, in other cases, for example, the endometrial cancer in the stage one we can perform, for example, a hormonal therapy. So, um, in, uh, in, for example, for stage 1A, we perform the hormonal therapies, or for uh, all uh, dysplastic lesion in, cer in cervix, for example, we can uh, postpone the surgery later. So, I think. But six uh, weeks, I think, is uh, the time, no more, to postpone the surgery. Yeah, I think I think the the comment about it being a kind of more time um, mentality is right. You know, we have to preserve resources because even with surgery, you know, you're not just using ventilators, but you're using blood products, you're using hospital resources, nursing. Well, not only that though, you're you if you operate on this lady, it means that you are not going to operate on a high grade endometrial, so you're going to have to choose. I mean, I, <clears throat> for each person, you're going to have to choose who is the most important to operate on there and that's what we're doing. So when we reshuffle our patients, we have limited resources, you know, we go down the priority list. So this is rational. And I will share some resources. I will share some resources at the end that are available that comment on, you know, when it's safe to like, prove safe to delay, just like you mentioned, Daniela, about the dysplasias and maybe the low grade and mutual cancer. We have a pathologist who's part of this webinar who actually um, made a comment about the importance of pathology, which I think we all agree with. There was also a question submitted I'd like to pose it to, to Dr. Liu. Should we avoid frozen sections at this time if we are operating on a patient? Uh, so I, I think it's a, a great to have a temporal uh, categories to just triage the patients uh, to have a different management. 
So, uh, like just uh, for uh, uh, gynecological cancers, I would prefer to manage the patients according to the uh, clinical stage and the uh, different types of cancer. As for example, for early stage ovarian cancer and the endometrial cancer, we can use, uh, we just uh, should put uh, these patients uh, as a uh, prior oral tithization to end go surgery, but uh, mm, not for early stage cervical cancer because uh, cervical cancer uh, just progress uh, slowly. Um, especially for the stage 1A and the stage 1B1. Uh, but uh, however, for those uh, patients with uh, advanced and uh, uh, recurrent disease, uh, uh, I think uh, the chemotherapy may, maybe is a uh, 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 best way for the alternative uh, uh, treatment. Uh, also, the radi radiotherapy is an alternative option for the cervical cancer and the endometrial cancer. Uh, also, uh, for the endometrial cancer, just uh, uh, like uh, uh, Daniela uh, mentioned, you can use a uh, hormone therapy to treat them to uh, for the delay uh, of uh, uh, surgery. So just uh, I think that uh, for the different types of cancer, for the different uh, clinical stages, we should use a uh, different uh, strategy uh, to manage them. Uh, also, I think uh, for those are uh, very uh, for, uh, like this lady, uh, can we try to use a PAP inhibitors because that's an oral medication. Can we use that to treat the these uh, uh, Maybe that's a, a late uh, advanced uh, ovarian cancer patient, uh, something like that. Yeah, that's, that's, a, my that's a great segue. There were a lot of comments on using oral alkylating agents that have come through. Um, you know, if the patient's BRCA positive, is it better to use a PARP inhibitor either sooner or even you know prior to chemotherapy to avoid immunosuppression and visits? What are what are the panel's thoughts with that? I'll start with you, Emma. Um, yeah, I mean, I think it's intriguing. I think during periods of high community um, levels of COVID-19, when you're very worried about the patient, the patient leaving their protected home, I think it's valid. Um, clearly, it's, we're functioning outside in a data-free zone when it comes to utilizing those agents, but it's almost a little bit of a preoperative window study um, being enforced here in practice to see how patients respond to these agents. Mm -hmm prior to, you know, a definitive management. And I think, so I think if it was a high baseline prevalence concern about bringing my patient um, in to, you know, a, a high risk setting, then that might be an option that I'd consider. Um, but, 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 but it certainly wouldn't be my first option. Renee, do you have any thoughts on that? Yes. Uh, one thing which is important to consider is what moment of the pandemic are you facing? the hospital or the country. If you are in the first part of the curve, you can operate your patients and take advantage of the availability of operating rooms, anesthetics, etc. When you reach the peak of the pandemic, definitively you will not have resources. And I think it's the moment to start delaying some treatments. But I think this is tricky and depends on the hospital, on the country, on the resources, all, all of those things have to be considered. Another issue is in some regions of Italy, they declare COVID-free hospitals in order to avoid contamination with COVID cases. And those hospitals uh, uh, used to, to handle cancer cases and the general medicine and the general um, consultations are managed in another hospitals. So it is important to try to reserve a free COVID environment in order to keep in, uh, administering oncological treatments. No, that's a great point. And several people have asked on the questions that have come in is um, what is the standard or what is your institution doing for pre-operative COVID testing? At our institution, we are not regularly doing it. We're screening patients, but we're not universally testing for surgical patients. Does anybody else have a different or um, separate experience? 
Are you testing patients if they show symptoms or have been exposed before surgery? We are. I assume that's probably general practice if, if the testing is available. Um, but we are not universally screening. I've heard some places uh, mention that they are doing universal screening prior to surgery. In developing countries, it's very difficult to, mm -hmm. to do universal testing for all the patients. So we have designed some questionnaires uh, about symptoms, about contact with positive cases, and we need to proceed according to, to the patients as said us. But every patient without testing should be considered as possible case and the PP measurements should be taken in the OR for all those patients. I know that um, in, in China, where they've had a little bit more experience and potentially June can speak to this. Um, the, the anesthesiology staff will often institute protocols of screening with temperature of all patients and a temperature greater than 97.3 will trigger uh, further workup. So they use a temperature. Now we obviously observe vi vital signs before all surgery in all patients, but we usually don't have hard metrics on when to postpone a surgery based on temperature. But using temperature is, is sort of one sort of fairly low tech, inexpensive way to help trigger or triage which patients preoperatively you might use that definitive COVID test that's hard to come by. So uh, actually <laughs> now, in oh, China, we, we test the people's uh, temperature everywhere. <laughs> uh, but uh, in our hospital, I work in a cancer hospital uh, and in Guangzhou in south of China. So in our uh, area, so the uh, COVID is not uh, so serious. And uh, we're almost uh, now back to the normal, uh, uh, normal status. Uh, for the operation and for the uh, chemotherapy uh, uh, to give the patients. Uh, but uh, we uh, test the, the patient, if the patient uh, are uh, hospitalized, uh, admitted to the hospital, uh, she need to be uh, test, uh, uh, give the CT, uh, thoracic CT scan uh, to see the, if there is any um, uh, changes in the, uh, both lungs and also they need to uh, test the temperature and also needs to test, uh, te uh, to test the uh, RNA uh, test. And so if the, the virus test is uh, negative, so she can be, uh, uh, she can be allowed to, to get uh, administered in the hospital. So this is in our area. But uh, I, uh, it's said in the Wuhan city, you know, that's a uh, uh, most uh, severe area uh, in this uh, uh, time. So it's still a very, uh, in a very uh, serious uh, restriction. And they need uh, maybe uh, two or three times of uh, viral uh, test uh, if uh, all the tests uh, is, uh, are the negative, so the patients can get into the uh, hospital, but uh, uh, the doctors there uh, told me, so many patients with uh, uh, gynecological malignancies are still in the delay of the surgery and the chemotherapy as well. Uh, maybe start from the April age. Uh, so many normal, uh, 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 I think um, uh, more and more uh, the, the surgeries and the chemotherapies are allowed to start, but uh, I think uh, that uh, will be the gradually to, uh, to be back to the normal. Thank you. Um, there was an interesting question that came up, and there may not be a, fine, a definitive answer, but one person had asked, what are the potential sequelae that COVID patients, positive patients, or patients who had infection, um, who've recovered may affect with future cancer care. So what are the things that you think we may need to look out for? Um, I'll pose this to Daniela first. Yeah. Um, as they said, the most problem in the future will be the delays for patients with COVID-19 infection because needs to remove, for example, from research trials and 
all of these things could lead to tumor progression and to have, unfortunately, a poorer outcomes. So I'm in contact with many patients associations worldwide for the advocacy program. And one of the most important things is that sometimes, unfortunately, we forget the psychological aspects in our patients during this important period, during this pandemic. So women, our patients have fear, are depressed, and have uncertainty about the future because about the possibility to have a cancer progression, as Emma said in her presentation before. So all these aspects can influence the future compliance um, and the patient-doctor relationship, in my opinion. So we need to talk with our patients by phone, by telemedicine, and need to stay, need to stay connected with them and keep attention to their needs. So in this way, we continue to, um, to have a best standard of care for our patient, minimizing the risk of infection. We should, we should encourage uh, in our routine the telemedicine, for example. So for follow-up visit, for evaluating the toxicity, for example, in the research trial, I think. I, Emma, do you have any thoughts? Oh, go I, ahead, Renee, I'm sorry. Yeah, I think it's important during this pandemic to discuss all the cases into a multidisciplinary, <laughs> multidisciplinary dispo conference because there is a shared responsibility among the, all the members of the therapeutic team. So you should include radiotherapists, medical oncologists, surgical oncologists, and also the patient and the patient willings, because we need to work together trying to provide the best care during these challenging times for, for all of us. Yeah, Dr. Rafi, any thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I think um, if the question is how do we how do we reinitiate therapy for the former COVID patient who ha also has a cancer diagnosis? I think. Um, you know, one thing that we're still trying to figure out here is how do we know when she has cleared her virus and is now safe to sort of uh, initiate immunosuppressive therapy or to come into the, to the office itself and, and be around other cancer patients. Um, for most people, they'll use sort of standards of three negative tests. Uh, they'll test about a week apart. And so we're potentially looking at additional delays in receiving cancer care at that point in time. But I think looking for at least three negative tests is probably um, a valid measure. And then there's you know, this de very deconditioning illness. So during that time that she is recovering from a viral illness, um, I think it's important that we are reaching out to her through our telemedicine, what other uh, resources we have to ensure that she is rehabilitating and getting um, the getting strong, getting good nutrition so that she can then embark on her cancer therapy when she's recovered from her virus. I wonder if even years from now, months from now, when the pandemic is hopefully contained and ideally over, if we're, we're going to have issues with ventilation in some of our patients who were COVID positive, you know, even if it's a year later and um, are we going to have issues administering certain therapies like that, for instance, which may have higher lung toxicity, are there other sequelae that we'll see? So I think it's really important, like Renee mentioned, that we, you know, work together. And our goal is as we continue these echoes that we have our colleagues from pathology and radiation oncology and, you know, uh, radiology as part of this to, to help us understand, because I think our, we're just at the, the beginning of our understanding of how it's going to impact us long term. I think we're struggling in the short term, but I think there's still a lot of long term issues that we'll, we'll uncover. There have been several questions about cervical cancer that I think are interesting. And some of the questions are regarding locally advanced cervical cancer. And I'll pose this to you first, Dr. Perea, is should we do, you know, higher doses and less frequent treatment for these patients? Or should we, you know, for brachytherapy, should we do nine grade in two fractions as opposed to seven grade in four fractions? What are your thoughts on, on kind of hyperfractionation of, of radiation therapy? Renee? 
we were discussing about hyperfractioning uh, with our department of cryotherapy and they're willing to start to do it with some selected patients but the evidence about safety of hyperfractionations is not as solid to offer to all the patients or to take a decision right now so it is is something to to consider but depends again on the institution and on, on the resources. And there's been several questions about surgery versus radiation therapy for low, for early stage cancers. And my two senses, you know, radiation is going to be more visits to the hospital. So if these patients can safely undergo surgery, you have the resource available, but that would be, you know, a one-time visit with a short recovery versus radiation where it's more frequent. Do the panelists um, have any comments on, on that? I think it's important to consider in low resource settings because if the patient has to go to the hospital 20 times for 20 sessions is 40 use of public transportations because it's not common to have a private vehicle in Latin America. So 40 expositions to metro, to, trans to buses. So we should consider if is uh, worthwhile to provide these to, to administer mm -hmm. radiotherapy to, to those patients with early stages. Another issue is, I have no doubt about postmenopausal patients, but I have several doubts for premenopausal patients to, to offer her radiotherapy. And then um, we've had, also had a lot of questions about the safety of minimally invasive surgery. So Wendell, I'll pose this to you. Can you comment? on the safety of laparoscopy or robotic surgery in the setting? Yeah, and I, I noticed these questions and, and uh, some have commented that they don't do any minimally invasive surgery. I think there's, um, there's certainly some risk to the OR personnel and as was pointed out, uh, the, the, the screen for symptoms, many of these patients who have the virus are asymptomatic. Uh, there is certainly potential for aerosolization with laparoscopy and there's a joint statement out that we probably shouldn't do laparoscopy on patients who were known or suspected to be COVID-19 positive. But right now our practice is to do the laparoscopic surgery in the patients who are not known to be positive. We are lucky enough to, to have uh, N95s uh, in the OR for all personnel on the, um, right now uh, that we reuse. And um, so we try to get them out of the hospital. Nobody gets admitted. So we do outpatient laparoscopic surgery for these patients and send them home. Um, we don't see them. We see them only in the OR and then they go straight home from the PACU. So, um, I, you know, I want to caution against some of the fear that's present um, regarding sur minimally invasive surgery in the setting of, of the coronavirus. You know, a lot of it is uh, largely, in fact, all of it is speculation. There's been no reported cases of transmission of COVID in the OR through transmission via um, aerosolization or smoke uh, of smoke plume, for example. Uh, smoke plume is created with many laparotomy surgeries as well when we use electrosurgery in open cases. So it's not, a, it's not singular to the laparoscopic experience. And I think it's really important to understand that um, minimally invasive surgery, as Dr. Nauman pointed out, is associated with less use of vital hospital resources, particularly hospitalization, blood products, and the potential for an ICU admission or a readmission to hospital. And so in the absence of any data that supports that this is a, a, a feasible route of transmission, and keep in mind, even with other viruses, we've not, there's not been documented transmission by a smoke plume um, for other viruses viruses, uh, even those that are bloodborne. Uh, so so in, in this setting, I think we should be careful about um, overreaching statements of um, bans against minimally invasive surgery, for example, even in COVID positive patients. Yeah. I think if you're operating on a COVID positive patient, clearly um, that's when uh, I mean, we should have ideally have practice universal precautions on all patients, but knowing that PPE is limited in many settings, um, certainly in patients with documented COVID-19, having personnel uh, minimize time in the OR around the time of intubation because that is the that is the time when transmission is the highest. So have only the necessary personnel in the room during intubation, and have other personnel fully fully dressed in in full PPE with appropriate donning and doffing procedures. 
um, I think is probably, but, but not excluding minimally invasive surgery, which will get that patient out of the hospital um, back into the community uh, faster. Now, to Dr. Rossi's point, we, we really need some documentation if, if the peritoneal cavity is even contaminated with this virus. We don't know that. If somebody has a protocol to test patients, that would be very helpful information to us, and, and particularly if you can quantify it. And uh, if I can, uh, just a brief uh, comment about this, because uh, recently, uh, Italian and China's team published uh, on Annals of Surgery a paper about the risk of minimal invasive surgery versus the conventional open approach uh, during COVID-19. So some recommendations uh, uh, in this paper to reduce, for example, the escape of gases, because uh, in general, as we know, previous researches have uh, shown that uh, the, in general, laparoscopy and electrical equipment can lead to a resolution, as Emma said, uh, for example, for hepatitis B, HPV, HIV. So probably due to pneumoperitoneum. So some recommendation could be use the specific safe devices during laparoscopy, filters or su suction devices, and keep the pneumoperitoneum pressure on the lowest possible and to reduce the Trendelenburg position time. And I think that uh, due to the lack of data, ideally, ideally we should consider laparoscopy for selected cases where clinical benefit uh, to the patient exceed the risk of potential infections. So ideally the best, uh, the best thing could be to test each surgical patient. In Italy, we start to test each surgical patient since two days. So I think it's, yes, ideally is the best. Thank you. We're, we're coming to the top of the hour and I know that this will be an ongoing discussion. Um, Kathy, if you could pull up my slides. I just want to share some resources with you that are available. And once again, these will be available on the website. I'm not going to go through them, but there are some comments here um, on recommendations. This is our website here that links to the COVID-19 specific resources. Um, and this will be on the slides available for you. The next slide is a um, uh, publication by the International Journal of Gynecologic Cancer, which Dr. Pereira was part of. And it just talks about some guidelines or considerations for outpatient clinic visits and management of disease, which I just summarized here. And obviously, cl clinical decision making is going to have to go into this. Similarly, the next slide um, is uh, SGO's guidelines, cited gynecologic oncology, which also provided some guidelines on high risk patients, general considerations, and management of disease. And then the last slide is a joint, uh, excuse me, this is a modified elective surgery acuity scale, so which patients really should be prioritized for surgery. Remember, this is going to be based on the resources that are available at your site, your personal COVID-19 experience and um, surge, and then also your clinical judgment. And then the next slide is um, guidelines on minimally invasive surgery, and I think this is constantly a moving target, so don't be surprised if things that are seen here are updated in the next few months weeks as we get more experience. I think taking every precaution to protect provider, staff, patients is, is a critical uh, need. Um, I think that's my last slide and I'd just like to thank all the pan um, oh and I'm sorry, this is the WH operational planning guidelines. This was just published uh, last week and it just provides some guidelines and I think it's just a reminder that we're learning how fragile our healthcare systems actually are. You know, there was a comment about developing countries. I think we're experiencing this in developed countries. So I think this is a, a lesson learned and hopefully we'll be better prepared day by day and in the future. Um, I'd like to thank the panelists for their participation and time. I'd like to thank all the attendees for their comments, and I'm sorry we didn't get to all of them. They were excellent questions, but we do hope that this is an ongoing um, uh, process. We will be providing a post-survey uh, um, questionnaire, and we ask that you put other topics that you're interested in hearing related to COVID-19. And then also, if you're interested in participating, we welcome people. We would love our members to be a part of this, so please let us know if you're interested or have specific topics that you're, you would like to discuss. Um, in our closing, I'll leave it to the panel if they want to leave the, the group with one last thought or tip or some positive motivation. <laughs> Thank
and I'll start with, before I before I turn it over to the the panelists. I'd also like to thank the IGCS staff. It was amazing, and this in such a short time frame. So um, I'd really like to um, give them uh, accolades for what they've put together and continue to put together. So I'll start with you, uh, Renee. Any comments for the the attendees? Yes, please stay safe. Try to give the better care you have to your patients and don't forget that we are doctors and we are in the front line on the treatment of patients with COVID. So we need to take care of us rather to, to take care of the others. June? Yes, so uh, we should keep ourselves stay uh, in safe. Uh, I think our hospital staff uh, also should protect it, uh, for their uh, own uh, safe. This, uh, uh, also, that's good for the patients. So I just uh, uh, recommend the uh, patients and doctors to more often use uh, uh, telemedicine. So in our hospital, we, we have a iCloud hospital, APP. So we just uh, talk to the, our patients uh, in the iCloud hospital more oftenly so we can give the patients uh, uh, advance. So just keep well. You're muted. But anyway, I would say um, uh, do push the hospitals. We, we had early on, uh, the hospital was trying to conserve PPE and um, you know, the physicians and the nurses and the people in the hospital are the most important resource we have. Um, and so push your hospital to do things that will protect your staff. Um, I will say that at least the initial reports in surgery are actually fairly um, good in that the risk of transmission is low um, in the OR uh, because everybody's got a mask on and they, they uh, there was an early report, I believe it was out of China, where they had 41 people exposed with just normal uh, masking and surgery uh, to somebody who turned out to be COVID positive and nobody got infected from that uh, exposure. So that's, that's certainly encouraging. Um, our world is facing a devastating crisis to this new virus. So we are physicians, it's true. But first of all, each of us is a person. So please, you don't forget to talk with your patients and stay connected with them. And it's really important to continue to share our experience by webinar, by teleconference, to improve the approach to care. Everything is gonna be all right, friends. Sorry, I got disconnected for a moment, but um, I'd like to close and thank everybody once again. And we'll look forward to, uh, to the next, to the next COVID-19 echo.